Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Making Gender Responsive Green Growth Happen. I'm Minori Lee and I'm the project lead for the Green Industry Platform, which aims to provide small businesses with the knowledge they need to become more competitive by going green. The Green Industry Platform was launched earlier this year by the GGKP, the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership, a global community of organisations and experts that aim to provide the policy business and finance communities with knowledge, guidance, data and tools to transition to an inclusive green economy. For those that are unfamiliar, the partnership was established in 2012 and is led by the GGGI, the green, Global Green Growth Institute, the OECD, UN Environment, UNIDO and the World Bank. Today's webinar is jointly organised with the DCED, the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development, a forum focused on pro-poor growth in line with the SDGs based on practical experience in private sector development. Building on a growing body of knowledge on the nexus of gender and green growth, the DCED's Green Growth Working Group has developed a set of practical guidance sheets with practical insight on how to make sure green growth is gender responsive on themes including green finance, green value chains, and green innovation and entrepreneurship. This webinar will share key messages on gender responsive national green growth strategies with lessons learned from on the ground experience in Western Central Africa and Vietnam. Before we get started, I'd like to encourage all of you to raise questions throughout the webinar. It's a great opportunity to engage directly with our speakers from GIZ, GGGI, and of course, the DCED. Just type your question into the chat box and our team will share it for our panelists to address during the Q&A period. After the webinar, we'd appreciate if you could take five minutes to complete our webinar survey. Your feedback is really valuable to us and will help us shape our future webinars. If you have any technical issues, email us at contact at ggkp.org and we'll help you troubleshoot. Finally, please note that a full recording of today's webinar, including all of today's presentations, will be available on the GDKP website shortly after the webinar. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Ingvild Solvang, who is the Sustainability and Safeguards Manager with GGGI. She has nearly 20 years of experience working in international development and humanitarian affairs. Based in Southeast Asia for nearly two decades, she has responded to emergencies while also managing development programs for various organizations worldwide, always with a focus on poverty reduction, gender equality, and social inclusion. Prior to joining GGGI's HQ in Seoul, Ingvil was the global lead for entrepreneurship with CARE's Women's Economic Empowerment Team. Ingvil, I am delighted to welcome you to today's webinar and I hereby turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Minori, for that introduction. And welcome, everyone, to this uh, webinar, Making Gender Responsive Green Growth Happen. It's an honor to be the moderator of the session today. And I'm, I'll be joined by a, a set of very inspirational speakers from different organizations. And my name is Ingrid Solvang. I work for the Global Green Growth uh, Institute. I'm based in Korea. And uh, just before I introduce our uh, presenters, um, I just want to frame the discussion a little bit today. Um, we know that both women and men are really important to the green growth transformation. We know that men and women are entrepreneurs, uh, uh, community leaders, stewards of natural capital, and agents of change. We also know that gender roles are deeply rooted in social, cultural, and economic structures, and that gender roles are different for men, for, for men and women and result in men and women being unequally uh, impacted by climate change and environmental degre degradation, and also impacted differently by the efforts that we are doing as practitioners of green growth to shift towards green economies. And the data is showing us uh, across the world, across societies and across economies that women tend to have lesser access to 
political and economic opportunities. And I believe that we are here at this webinar, uh, us as presenters and also you as the audience, we are here because I think we believe that this shift towards green growth is an opportunity to move away from business as usual, not only in an economic and environmental sense, but also in a social sense, uh, creating more just, more inclusive and so societies that, are, that, that have gender equality. Uh, and this is, of course, important because gender equality is about human rights and principles of good governance. Uh, it is also an accelerator of economic growth and environmental sustainability. So basically, I hope today that we are going to be discussing also some of the evidence that we have that gender equality is good for business and important to achieving sustainable development goals across all the 17 goals that we that we have. Um, so um, I will be joined by um, uh, Catherine uh, Miles uh, from the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development. She has been an advisor um, uh, generating some lessons learned and, and practical guidelines for green growth. Um, so she will be presenting uh, her, her experience in a minute. Uh, we also have Justina uh, Groshan, who is a project manager, manager uh, for sustainable economic development uh, for GIZ in Vietnam. And she will be giving us some case studies for gender responsive green growth. Um, and finally, we will have a presentation from Elena Ruiz Abril, who is a regional policy advisor for UN Women in West and Central Africa on women economic empowerment. But before I hand it over to, um, to, to Catherine as our first presenter, I would wish to share a little bit about our experience in GGGI. Uh, I think that is an interesting place to start because GDGI is a young organization. We were very much born out of the environmental and the economic sectors primarily, always knowing that the social is important. Um, but uh, we have been able to, in the, in, particularly in, in the last two to three years, invest in embedding the social in the mere definition of green growth. And so GGGI is working, uh, we are an intergovernmental organization. We have about 37 members and our uh, mission is to support our members in transforming economies towards a green growth model, particularly in the sectors of sustainable energy, water and sanitation, sustainable landscapes and green cities. Um, next slide, please. And uh, I believe if we want to achieve green growth as institutions and as practitioners of green growth, I believe that it's very important that we embed gender equality and social inclusion into the institutional DNA where we work. Um, so if we define green growth as economic growth, which is both, both environmentally sustainable and socially inclusive, Basically, what I like to say in GGGI is that if it isn't gender responsive, it is not green. And the way that I've been working to embed that in our organization is really to work on uh, with my colleagues on, on having the policy framework in place internally in GGGI, which then leads us also to have a strategic framework for gender equality, embedding objectives for gender equality into our results-based management framework and uh, also into the assessments and diagnostics methodologies that we use together with our partner governments to identify interventions uh, that support the shift towards green growth. Um, and I think only by looking internally at how we are um, how we are, are dealing with this internally, I, I believe we, are, we will be effective in achieving equal, uh, just and sustainable uh, green growth uh, out there in the real, real world uh, in terms of external impact on gender equality. Next slide, please. Uh, and one of the things that we have recently launched in GGGI is our green growth 
index and we are also in 2020 going to be working on developing a policy simulation tool and i think that is a good place to to, to start uh, to show how we are as an uh, as an organization developing a metric for sustainable development that incorporates the economic growth aspect of green growth alongside environmental and social uh, dimensions of green growth and having an index to work with our governments, uh, to use with, with our partner governments, uh, provide policymakers with an opportunity to look at baseline in terms of how are we as a, as a, a, as a country or as a city or as a, sub, uh, as a state doing in terms of green growth. And, and incorporating the social there um, is a bit of a methodological challenge, which indicators are we going to use and how are we going to, to weigh the social uh, in, in the context of this index, uh, but I do believe it's, it's really important to highlight that the social is interlinked and interconnected with economic growth and with environmental sustainability. Um, and uh, having a simulation tool later with, will support uh, decision maker, makers in playing around with, with different uh, policy options, also policy options that are gender responsive, to see how that may impact um, a country's performance uh, aligned with this, uh, this green growth index. Uh, next slide, please. And the work that we have then been doing, building up this, this sort of, of, of uh, experience, generating our definition of what green growth means out there in the world has also impacted the way that we are now finally after seven years of existence, um, GGGI is that young as an organization established in 2012. Now we are able to clearly articulate and identify impact areas for gender equality. So when we are working on green growth planning, green, po green policies or investment interventions or mobilizing green finance, we are able now to, I, I like to call it demystify gender equality by speaking concretely about how we as an institution institution believe that we can have an impact in promoting gender equality. Uh, these four areas for us being um, number one, inclusive decision making and planning processes, and number two, enhancing access to sustainable services for men and women, particularly sanitation, energy, transport and water. And then number three, economic empowerment, particularly for women. Uh, and then number four, increased resilience in climate adaptation. And of course, these impact areas may be different for your institution, depending on the specific nature of the type of work that you do. But what I believe is very important is that once we now have these, these uh, impact areas defined, we are also able to embed them directly into our resource-based management system systems uh, with indicators. Um, and it also sort of underpins our usage of the OECD DAC gender markers that we as GGGI apply to our, our projects. Next slide, please. And I'll just very quickly give you some examples of the work that we do. This year, we have, uh, we have been working on the subnational uh, state level Sonora uh, green growth strategy in Mexico, where we incorporated gender indicators, which created a platform for us to bring together members of different uh, state government departments to uh, a, a training program on gender equality across different departments and sectors, which culminated in a set of recommendations to the state government on how to mainstream gender across the the state government uh, policies. Next uh, slide, please. In Vanuatu, we have supported a national financing vehicle for green energy, where we uh, also have inter integrated gender responsive financing criteria. Uh, we also succeeded in, in facilitating the head of the uh, Women's Affairs, uh, Department of Women's Affairs, to become a member of the funds board in order to, to sustain a focus on, on gender equality and women's empowerment uh, in the, the financing of different energy projects. Next slide, please. 
And finally, uh, we are also working with partners on our global greenpreneur program, which is an, an, a, a, basically a, an entrepreneurship competition uh, for young entrepreneurs. And uh, we are using gender desegregated data to track uh, entries and finalists. Um, and uh, a very positive and happy news in 2019, all three uh, top three finalists uh, by merit were uh, represented by women, uh, which I believe illustrates uh, the way that women really are a, a force for change, uh, that women are very attracted to green and sustainable uh, business and the green shift. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's really good news. Next slide, please. So a lot of uh, interesting work going on for us, still with a lot of challenges uh, to, to gender mainstream that I hope that we can also hear from our my fellow presenters uh, about how to bring diverse sets of stakeholders on board. We are working with bankers, we are working with environmentalists. How can we all speak the same language around gender equality and women's empowerment? One of my challenges is, is what I like to call the slippery project cycle that you may start out ambitious and with best intentions in terms of bringing about transformational um, gender uh, change to, 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 to uh, gender relations. Uh, however, th these targets may slip and fall and, and become lost and forgotten before you come to the end of your project. Um, and finally, simply how do we effectively empower women and bring about gender equality and green growth a green economy climate action and or development depending on what type of terminology suits the type of work that you are doing and um, so with that um i wish to um invite um Catherine miles um from donor committee for enterprise development um to share her experience Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Ingrid. And it's a pleasure to speak to you all today. Um, as has been mentioned, this year, uh, the DCED commissioned a series of guidance sheets to support development practitioners to integrate gender responsive approaches into green growth programming. They're available on the DCED website, so do take a look at those when you get a chance. Just to clarify, there's an overall guidance sheet and these five thematic guidance sheets on the related topics of gender responsive green growth. And today, what I'm going to focus on specifically is the one on gender gender responsive macroeconomic policies and green growth strategies. Next slide, please. So first of all, um, some context. We're, we're sitting here and it's really timely that we're sitting here today talking about this topic as representatives of our government. So in the midst of climate negotiations in Madrid, uh, for those of you who weren't aware, yesterday was actually Gender Day in Madrid. And, uh, and so negotiations have been going um, on related to, to getting that perspective into to the outcome document. Um, we're all aware that global warming is more than one degree above pre-industrial levels and set to exceed the Paris Agreement global goal of a less than 1.5 um, degrees C. And with that um, in mind, there are not only these urgent uh, calls for action um, and the climate emergency, um, but there's also this growing recognition um, globally around that the economic model that we're working on, uh, we've been working on for generations, is now unsustainable and that green growth is needed. Now, green growth, as we've heard from Ingrid, is uh, around this balance of environmental sustainability and social inclusion. It's where poverty reduction, job creation and social inclusion are achieved through economic growth, but not at the expense of the environment. Yet, when we talk about gender, essentially existing levels of gender inequality are undermining this transition at the moment and uh, to achieve what we're aiming for, which is an inclusive green economy. Um, so women and men are more likely to be uh, women are more likely to be poor than men. Um, women have lower um, participation rates economically overall and in some of the key sectors um, uh, within um, the, the green economy. So, for example, 20 percent of the renewable uh, work for, uh, energy workforce are, are currently women. Um, if you look at infrastructure, only 19 percent of leadership positions in the infrastructure sector are currently held by women. Um, and although the data is slightly dated, um, the last count, only 24% of the leadership positions of governing bodies of multilateral um, green finance firms were women. So um, there's a, a lot of work to, to do in that area. 
Also, just again, to provide a little bit of context, typically an economy only gives women three quarters of the rights of men, according to Women in Business and the Law in uh, 2019, a really great resource that I recommend that you look at if you haven't already seen it. And in terms of unpaid care, women are continuing to do at least 2.6 times the unpaid care or domestic work than men do, restricting their time available for paid employment. And finally, there's a 9% uh, gender gap in financial access um, for women in developing economies as well. So overcoming these constraints um, are going to be really key to achieve uh, an inclusive green economy. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, within this framework, um, there is growing recognition that we need to address gender equality to promote um, economic stability and growth and achieve what the goal um, we're talking about today, which is inclusive green growth. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, back one slide, please. There we go. Um, so just to clarify the policy context just a little bit, this relationship between gender equality, women's um, economic empowerment and green growth is set out in the SDGs. It's also in other international policy frameworks. So if you aren't aware, there's actually a gender action plan in the UNF triple C um, uh, framework. So they've got this uh, um, standalone gender action plan, which uh, I would recommend you all look at if you haven't seen that already. Um, and, uh, and these uh, the frameworks that are providing a real starting point um, for the entry points for mainstreaming gender and achieving uh, a gender responsive green growth. Um, and so um, in terms of definitions, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, what we're what we're looking at is a transition to a a, a, a green economy, an inclusive green economy that uh, that accounts for the dynamics of these so socially co constructed behaviours, norms, and relationships between women and men, but also is explicitly trying to uh, focus on um, uh, redressing existing imbalances whereby women have been dis discriminated in, in the past and, and still face discrimination and um, which are embedded in social norms. So gender responsive ap approaches are those um, when we look at national green growth strategies and macroeconomic um, policies that go beyond sort of this do no harm principle but also overcome um, these historical gender biases. Specifically when we're talking about gender responsive green um, macroeconomic policies. Here we're talking about performance and behaviour in economy that accounts in such a way that these structural barriers that I've referred to already that are driving inequalities uh, uh, related to gender um, are, are addressed um, and, uh, and also um, they promote the conservation of natural capital and efficient use of natural resources as well. And so policies that uh, we talk about when we're talking about macroeconomic policies that are gender responsive might relate to a labour market policies, tax, government spending and borrowing, trade and monetary policies and credit rules as well. And then specifically when we look at um, gender responsive nation, uh, national green growth strategies, those are the ones that are accounting again for these social norms between men and women in the way that it incentivizes behavior change both by firms, by companies, um, small and large, and consumers that facilitates this reallocation of jobs and capital and technology towards economic activities that are promoting inclusive growth. Next slide, please. So, first of all, um, when we're talking about why focusing on gender and green growth strategies and macroeconomic policies, it's important to say there is no such thing as gender neutral green growth um, processes or approaches, um, because all green growth transformation processes, including the financing and, and the strategies that sort of guide them, impact on and are impacted by gender norms in society. These may be unintended or, or intended and may have unintended consequences as well. And so we really need to be considering them in the development of, of these, uh, these strategies. So I've already touched on um, that gender is integrated and, and gender equality into these international commitments. And so when we look at national green growth strategies, we have to take these international commitments and transfer them um, at a, a, a national level. And that's why it's really imperative that we have gender equality factored into that. Um, and they are in these national green growth strategies. We also have to account for the fact that policies and strategies impact women and men differently because of their positions in the economy. 
Also, when we're developing the policies, um, women and men as policy makers can be involved to differing extent, extents in the development of the national green growth strategies and um, plans and in their implementation. So we've got to be really cognizant of how many women um, and in what roles are they being engaged in these processes. Also, um, what's clear and becoming even stronger as evidence is building is that gender equality is a promoting economic stability and growth. Um, there's a lot of work being done by um, uh, the IMF around that, which I can point you to. Um, but any economic instability, conversely, can more severely impact women because, for example, it may mean that uh, cutbacks on government spending means that women uh, end up spending more time in unpaid household care at the expense of paid employment. We've also got to think of, of um, the extent to which women are participating in public-private dialogue in the development of these strategies. Often there can be constraints to women getting engaged in these processes, partly because of unpaid care responsibilities, mobility constraints and other factors. Um, and so that is a, a, a real issue to bear in mind. And um, in terms of barriers to economic participation, there's, uh, there's an opportunity for national green growth strategies to address some of these directly related to tax policies, what encourages or discourages, what incentives are there for women to enter the workforce and work formally rather than informally. What are the legal barriers to women's labour force participation in certain industries or times of the day? And to what extent are um, sex disaggregated data um, and indicators incorporated into um, policy making, decision making? Um, so at the moment, GDP calculations, for example, don't take into account unpaid care tasks often that women are undertaking at the expense to paid employment. So macroeconomic policies and green growth strategies can address these um, and, uh, and, and so there's a real opportunity for us to do that if we're looking to achieve inclusive green growth. Next slide please. So in terms of the research um, that was done um, for, for this guidance note, we looked at the topics I've already addressed to, in terms of the framing and looked at how um, in existing donor programmes um, have, have um, these programmes been integrating gender responsive approaches into programmes that incorporate maybe not wholly are so, uh, and solidly focused on macroeconomic policies and national green growth strategies, but maybe incorporate elements of that into wider programming. And what we found was that um, there are programmes that are providing technical support within the context of national green growth um, policies and relate, uh, uh, policies and related sort of larger policies. Um, an example of that is the UNIDO, um, UNDP um, and others um, page um, programmes. Um, there's also uh, evidence that uh, programmes are consulting women and gender experts and engaging with ministries responsible for women's affairs in the uh, development of these strategies, as we've heard from GGGI. We've also got examples of approaches where individuals and, um, and individual and institutional capacity building initiatives for policymakers who are involved in the development of green growth strategies um, are incorporating gender into the content of um, the capacity building, but also are looking at it in terms of women's participation in those programmes as policymakers. And so um, GGI's work is one example of that. Um, in terms of research to inform gender responsive green um, policy development, UN Women, who we'll hear from later, and GIZ as well, have also uh, been engaging in, in that kind of approach, um, as have um, has GIZ specifically in the design of sex disaggregated um, data and gender indicators to inform the development of such green growth policies. Um, and multiple programmes out there, and you can see in the guidance sheet examples of, of which, have been producing gender and green growth policy and knowledge um, product documents and so um, that, that seems to be quite a common approach that is taken. Just um, if we go to the next slide please you can see some of the examples of donor programs that have adopted the, pro uh, the approaches I've mentioned. I won't go through all of them here now you're going to hear from some of them in a moment and so you'll have the opportunity um, to hear directly from them um, uh, then. If we go to the next slide please. So in terms of recommendations, um, what we can see uh, is, and I guess maybe first of all, really it's a key lesson learned, is that many governments 
internationally have, have made these commitments to gender equality and women's economic empowerment. So if you're engaging at a national level on developing national green um, growth strategies that are gender responsive, using that and these uh, these 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 international references as a a point of um, a starting point for the development of, of these policies is a really good um, way to go about it because they've already got those commitments there. It's just about operationalizing them. But how to, to do that? First of all, there's some really good resources out there. There aren't that many on macroeconomics and gender, but it, there are some, including um, from the Canadian government um, and uh, the IMF. And so we can point uh, you in those directions if you look at the guidance sheet. Um, and that can give you just some background information, as can um, information from the likes of the ILO on unpaid care work um, and informal employment. Women, Business and Law has a great resource as well, as you're doing your diagnostics of programmes, um, so you can see um, what are the legal constraints that maybe need to be factored into an, any national green growth strategies. Um, so there's uh, at the start of any design process and diagnostic process, um, there is an important aspect of institutional coordination and ensuring that there is gender balance in the participation of, uh, of the coordination um, committee. Um, and that includes female representatives um, from different departments and not just necessarily from the Ministry of Women, um, but also ensuring engagement from the Ministry of Women. And again, that representative may be male as well as uh, or female, but it's just getting that gender balance participation and ensuring that uh, the, uh, the, the lead uh, agency on gender um, equality and women's affairs is incorporated into that process. Also building in at the beginning of the process, a focus on sex disaggregated data. Often that comes at the monitoring and evaluation stage, but it really needs to be in the diagnostic and design phase, both gathering that data to inform the design of um, the, the, the policy, and also ensuring that as part of any programming, you work with the, um, the statistical office to, in advance to ensure that they're going to be able to collect that data to inform um, the, uh, to the extent to which that policy has been implemented. At the implementation level, um, there, a great starting point um, that we've, we've learned from this work is conducting a gender analysis on existing green growth policies and gender policy impact assessments of related laws. So um, yeah, a lot of this is already there, and so it's about going in and looking at to what extent have they already addressed gender? And if um, if they um, have, that's great, and then it's built, it can be built on. And if not, um, then that's where um, the, uh, the programming can come in and support uh, that going forward. If um, there's an opportunity to start from scratch in terms of developing a national green growth strategy, it's really critical to ensure in the context and in the strategic objectives, um, there is this focus on the gender equality context um, for uh, na uh, na uh, green growth at a national level and including objectives that are both sex disaggregated and women targeted and that that then gets reflected in both the activities and the outputs outcomes and in the indicators that are used to track progress. Um, and, uh, and there needs to be a focus around disclosure as well, so that we can see that companies that are engaging in the green economy are themselves um, looking at it from a gender, um, gender perspective and reporting and disclosing where appropriate sex disaggregated information. Um, there is uh, also an opportunity to build a capacity, um, both um, with policymakers companies and entrepreneurs and ensuring that gender is um, factored into the content of that not of that training and not just looked at in terms of um, women's participation in those program although that would be important as well and, uh, and a, a key resource I can point to and before I close is just to say that um, there uh, is some work that has been done, done um, recently um, around women's organisations and climate finance and financing is a key aspect of a national green growth strategy so you have to look at what the constraints are to women's financial inclusion in a particular context and also ensure that women's groups are engaging in this process of, of um, the policy development to understand what is it the constraints that um, they, they face and see on the ground so that that can be incorporated into the content of the, the policy and, uh, and, and then um, progress can be tracked uh, related to that. And finally, as referred to before, it's really 
key to ensure that any monitoring and evaluation captures both sex disaggregated indicators, but also gender indicators to see what has the impact been of the green growth policy? Has it really truly been gender responsive? Um, at this point, I'd like to just conclude and say thank you for your attention and pass back to Ingrid. And I look forward to having more conversations about this in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Catherine. And also thank you so much for this gift you have given the Green Growth community in uh, collecting all these, uh, these, uh, gui this guidance and, and these lessons. Um, I had the pleasure of engaging you, engaging with you in that process. And uh, it has, uh, uh, it has uh, culminated in quite a lot of interest in turning in GGGI. So we've, uh, we are uh, really enjoying uh, enjoying your work um, and um, to, to build on your presentation Catherine uh, I want to invite um, Justine uh, Groshan uh, who is a project manager as mentioned for, for GIZ in Vietnam and she is going to show us an example of uh, gender responsive uh, green growth planning um, in the context Text of, uh, of her, her work, which I believe will highlight some of the issues that, that Catherine has raised and also some of the questions that I see are coming in from the audience uh, around how we, how we look at policies and how we look at ways to measure impact of policies and so forth. So, uh, Justine, um, please, I'll hand the floor over to you. Yes, thank you, Ingrid. Um... I'm, it is a pleasure to be here today with you once again um, in a um, Green Growth Knowledge Platform webinar and thank you to the organizers and uh, welcome to all the participants. Again, I'm Justina, I'm a project uh, manager in Vietnam. I'm sorry, I'm getting some news that uh, you don't see me. Okay, you can see me again, I hope. Um, so I'm project manager for sustainable economic development in Vietnam. It's been um, almost four years and uh, we are working or I have been working on green growth, SDGs and most recently on the social dimensions of sustainable green growth, where we uh, particularly focus on gender and social aspects. Um, so for today, I will bring in some uh, cases, several cases, uh, which are some of them work in progress, some of them uh, completed work on how we as GIZ integrate gender in our work with um, counterparts in Vietnam on green growth and SDGs. Um, so if you could please uh, pass on to the next slide. Um, I'm going to put a little bit um, the whole discussion into the context, the national context first, um, and then um, discuss can you switch to the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. Um, how we integrate gender in our work, uh, which um, re refers to formulating strategies, um, then monitoring and data, which was mentioned by um, the previous speakers, um, and policy impact assessments as a tool to really, at the planning stage, integrate already and, and um, make the policymakers think of gender and social aspects and then some lessons learned in that work. So for the um, scene, setting the scene in Vietnam, um, Vietnam is actually relatively progressive on gender equality. Um, however, as you can see, that's a snapshot from our um, infographics from the voluntary national review of the Agenda 2030 last year. Um, only 26% um, are deputies in National Assembly. There are very few ministers that are women. So basically the leadership positions in Vietnam are um, male dominated. Um, there are the most challenges I would say related to gender equality are um, yeah, women in leadership positions. The retirement age that is much lower for women, um, it's actually 50 years old, which means that women have actually literally much less time if you remove you know, maternity leave and so on to um, achieve a career. There are some occupations that are forbidden for women, like working in narrow spaces or being forensic doctors. Um, and uh, some issues with land rights, I think someone also mentioned it. So there are some, uh, these are some of the challenges that we also try to look at when we work on green growth. Uh, so uh, please, the next slide. Um, in our work at uh, GIZ in Vietnam, we have been basically supporting three, let's say, main areas. First of which um, 
is supporting the green growth strategy. I think GGGI also pointed out that they did that in Mexico on a subnational level. So what we um, are doing is on the national and provincial level, then we are supporting the monitoring data disaggregation. And the third one is, as I said, policy impact assessment. And I would like to bring in one particular example that is most recent on the law on biodiversity, where we conducted a gender gap analysis and with some interesting findings. Um, so please um, move on to the next slide. Um, for the Green Growth, Vietnam Green Growth Strategy, it was um, adopted in 2012 with an action plan uh, in 2014. And it's basically a strategy that stipulates um, uh, needs for lowering the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions, um, and um, engaging in sustainable consumption and production or lifestyle, green lifestyles. And um, in the VGGS, the first phase, what we call, so actually the, um, the, the period for the first GGGS to achieve some objectives is um, at in an ending stage, so until 2020. Uh, and we are currently in the process of reviewing um, the first phase or the, the VGGS um, and identifying gaps in terms of social and gender aspects so that in the process of the revision of the v Vietnam Green Growth Strategy next year, in 2020, we make sure to integrate them better. So basically the planning ministry, the Ministry of Planning and Investment actually identified, well, there are some gaps. We um, can do better on that and we want to work with you on uh, finding solutions and uh, recommending concrete issues that we can include in the second phase. Um, so this is, as I said, work in progress. We have a first analysis conducted um, with some case studies, for example, on ethnic minority women and uh, traditional occupations in Vietnam that um, are uh, affected or their contribution to green growth. Um, but these are uh, first results and we'll continue on with that work. Um, next slide, please. In terms of monitoring and data disaggregation, we um, have engaged on different levels. Um, first, in the development of green growth indicators in Vietnam that is still in uh, progress, in a consultative progress, uh, pro process at the moment, let's say. We um, have an additional resource person from the General Statistics Office that is um, that's, whose job is really to look at disaggregation, how we can make sure that the data is disaggregated, indicators, and if there are any specific social or gender indicators related to green growth that could be included so that the monitoring of the Vietnam green growth strategy from the last phase and going on into the second phase um, is facilitated. For the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, of course, all SDGs have um, are cross, uh, like have gender as a cross-cutting issues, but there are also some uh, concrete gender indicate or gender targets and indicators. We have supported the General Statistics Office and the Ministry of Planning and Investment in um, drafting, redeveloping the Vietnam SDGI, the Vietnam Sustainable Development Goal Indicator Set. So from, I think we had at the beginning, more than 200 indicators, we went down to 158. And it was really a very um, long but very rewarding pro uh, process in which we consulted with different stakeholders and um, we, uh, of course, made sure that gender or people with disabilities, um, these are the two particular topics that we focus on, are included. And we are, um, now we have the results of a first review study for the implementation of gender-related VSDGI, Vietnam SDG indicators. Um, and this will be, so it's basically a study that's reviewing SDG by SDG uh, where Vietnam stands on gender. Uh, not for all SDGs, but a selection of them. And um, it's basically a basis for the next year's progress report to the Prime Minister on um, Agenda 2030 implementation. So two topics were selected by the government, gender as a cross-cutting issue and climate change. And um, for the third part, it's the National Gender Indicator System. That's um, the last uh, achievement with the General Statistics Office. We uh, were um, along the World Bank um, and Australian aid. We were uh, together in this process of 
developing the national set of indicators and um, making sure that there is coherence between the SDGI, the Vietnam SDG uh, indicators, and the national gender indicator set. Uh, so actually it was very easy because in the end the same department was working on it, so uh, we were very much on the same page um, in that respect. And although we don't have concretely green growth gender indicator in the gender uh, indicator set, um, those which are referring to employment, income, land rights, education, governance are of course crucial for green growth. Um, so that's why I found it important to mention it in the context of this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, the third area where we engage very closely with different government agencies are policy impact assessments. So policy impact assessments are um, mandatory in the Vietnamese uh, lawmaking process. And um, for the policy impact assessment, um, for the revision of the biodiversity law, which will happen next year, probably into 2021, actually, it's a longer process, we have conducted the first gap, gender gap analysis, um, based on the implementation of the current version of the biodiversity law, um, to identify the most urgent needs on gender equality. So we had desk research and surveys in three provinces, Lao Cai, which is in the northern area, mountainous area, Kon Dao Vung Tao and Hao Zhang, which are two provinces in the Mekong Delta. Next slide, please. And the first uh, results that um, I found particularly interesting is that basically in the biodiversity conservation areas, women are much more closer to um, to the natural capital, to the uh, resources, because men uh, go to work outside of the biodiversity conservation areas, mostly in cities or tra as transports or uh, in, in transport sector, for example, or construction. However, it's, the, it's expected of men to attend community meetings and take decisions that are relevant for the conservation areas. So when women participate in the meetings, they deputy for their husbands mostly or partners and it's not because they have the key role that they play but they basically are there as deputies then um, an interesting fact is that only 18 percent of women are the only ones that are named in the certificates of land rights compared to 44 percent in name of the men um, same goes for contracts um, so for example households some households can plant sugar can or rice or um, uh, like collect the honey of, uh, of bees in biodiversity conservation areas. But for that, that contract, most of them are on the name of the men, although physically very often they are not even there. Um, the same goes for uh, access to loans uh, in banks. Um, it's um, basically mostly in men's um, name. Next slide, please. Um, oh, and one more aspect is that women from ethnic minorities, sometimes they do not have the right to inherit land, so they go automatically to men. Not all, because there are some ethnic minorities where they're actually very matriarchal, so, um, but these are the, the three provinces that we focused on. Um, yeah, so as I said, um, men go away, women stay, they are closer to natural capital, but still they are not really rewarded in terms of land rights. Um, they also do not necessarily have the knowledge that is sufficient to allow them for forest protection or protection of the resources. And um, another aspect is that um, often they speak dialects and um, most trainings, propaganda are available in uh, King's language, which is the Vietnamese, let's say the national language, but not in the dialects. So the ethnic minorities and especially the women have a very, very, sometimes very low understanding of um, um, biodiversity conservation. And they, from themselves say, well, this is actually men's job to protect the forest, not mine. So there is a kind of a mismatch between the knowledge and, um, and their potential actually of the, the opportunity they have. So these are some of the findings of, uh, which I found particularly interesting from that study, gender gap analysis. And I would like to conclude with um, some um, uh, insight. If you could please switch to the next, my last slide. Um, so I think all of the speakers mentioned that we need a 
gender responsive green growth and of course I would say that we and Vietnam is pretty much on doing a lot of effort on the gender responsive uh, part. The proof of that is, for example, the, the strong emphasis on indicators and data disaggregation and the very strong commitment to collect disaggregated data. For example, in the population census of 2018 and 19, the General Statistics Office committed to um, align the questions, um, I think, uh, it was to 40, at least 40% with the SDGs and particularly looking at the aspect of gender. And um, so integrating gender aspects in green growth is crucial, but um, the point is that there is a necessity to review laws and secondary legislation in order for it to be gender transformative. So for example, if you look at um, the biodiversity gender gap analysis, you see that the land rights, um, in some cases, not even according to law, but even custom law, right, that ethnic minorities cannot, uh, women cannot inherit are there. So there is a need to even shift that, that customs or, or, or other legislation, like to change the, the prohibited list of occupations for women. Um, so this is a very much whole of a government approach, and it's um, often quite difficult to address that only working on green growth and gender. So we need to work together with other actors, other ministries, other donors, and to make sure that this is a coordinated and really transformative approach. Um, so in the future, we are planning to conduct more gender trainings with our partner ministries. We have um, done a lot of those within GIZ, but we want to expand those and, and include our counterparts ministries. And um, we want to do more policy um, impact assessment with focus on gender and social impacts, like on waste management and environmental protection. These are the two that for sure are planned for next year and uh, 2021. So I think with that, I would uh, leave it. I think I um, spend more time than um, uh, planned. I hope um, you um, could take some concrete uh, real life examples from um, Vietnam and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justina. That was a great presentation. And, um, and I think it gets particularly interesting when you start to drill down into to the, uh, the biodiversity policy work that, that really shows some of these, these complicated issues. And I think you're, you, you, you generated a few questions along the way. And hopefully we will have some time after the, the final presentation to address some of the audience questions. I think you quite specifically or already spoke to one of the questions that did come in on how do we erase those cultural barriers to women empowerment and, and autonomy. And I, and I like what you say that sometimes it is about really working, working uh, cross sectorally and, and across many stakeholders and addressing it at, at, at many different levels. And, and in your, your, exam your example on, on land rights issue is of course a, a very central issue, which I believe also will be touched upon in the next presentation by Elena Ruiz Abril from UN Women in Western Central Africa uh, and uh, her amazing work on uh, women and agriculture. So I'll hand over to you, Elena. Thank you very much, uh, um, Ingrid. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to present uh, um, the experience of UN women um, working on uh, empowering women through climate uh, resilient agriculture. Um, next slide, please. Just to give you some background, um, UN Women, as you know, is the UN entity that works for gender equality and women's empowerment. We work in five different areas, um, women's political participation, women's economic empowerment, violence against women, peace and security, and planning and budgeting. As part of the work that we do in uh, women's economic empowerment, as you can see in the second pillar, we have three uh, flagship programs, uh, three uh, ways in which to attack and, and, and promote women's economic empowerment, and one of them is climate uh, resilience agriculture. Next slide, please. On, on why, why women in climate resilient agriculture. Uh, next slide. Um, 
the answer to that it's uh, uh, the SDGs and, and we as UN women are the custodian for SDG 5 on gender equality and women's empowerment but we also believe that um, you, um, SDG 5 it's uh, an accelerator to achieve many uh, other SDGs. Uh, the flagship program that UN Women has on women's participation in climate uh, a smart agriculture value chain uh, brings together two important uh, aspects. One is women's economic empowerment, the other is climate action, but it also touches upon many other uh, SDGs. So uh, why the focus on agriculture? Um, in the case of Africa, uh, there is a, a, a main reason. It's an important contributor to growth uh, as a sector. If done properly, it can be an, an important contributor to green growth. And women are already playing a critical role in the sector. Um, in some countries, they do more than 70% of, of the agricultural work. But this is work that is done informally, sometimes unpaid. So we want to change that. We want to to have a model that helps women, uh, that empowers women uh, through participation in, in agriculture. And, and that's the program that uh, we have defined as a women's participation in, in value chains. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So basically, uh, the program uh, has four main pillars. And the picture uh, in the slide is quite telling because uh, we need the four pillars. Um, if you remove one of them, the house uh, falls. Um, so we have a, a first uh, component policy focused on access to land, promoting women's access to land. We heard the experience just now from Vietnam. So the situation in Africa, um, it's uh, uh, as well a large gap in uh, between men and women in terms of access to find uh, access to land. Sometimes it's a matter of not having the right legislation and there we work with authorities to have good policies in place and good um, legislation. But other times, uh, as we saw in, in, in Vietnam, it's a matter of application of that, uh, those policies. So we also work with authorities at the national, regional and local level uh, to support uh, the implementation of land reform in a way that uh, respects and guarantees women's rights. And we also work with women to make sure that they know their rights and they can um, actually access land uh, for their agribusiness uh, um, ventures. The second um, pillar uh, is access to climate smart information, skills and technology. We all know that at the community level, women play a critical role in managing natural capital, but sometimes they miss uh, the tools, tools in the form of latest information on climate smart uh, production transformation techniques or energy, energy efficient technologies. So we are trying to bridge that gap through training uh, and through uh, technology uh, adoption. The third uh, pillar uh, in, in, a value, in, in a value chain model is access to finance. Uh, and here we are trying to go beyond small finance for small groups of women, saving groups. We are trying to really find solutions for women to access mainstream uh, commercial finance. Um, and for that, we, we do intermediation and, and dialogue with the uh, private sector financial institutions. And the last uh, pillar is access to markets. Uh, you might have uh, uh, the land, uh, the information, the product, uh, the credit, but if you don't have a, a market to, um, to place your products, uh, it's hardly an empowering um, uh, model. So we work to facilitate uh, the links between women, producer transformers and, and, and the buyers. And we have developed uh, a technology digital solution that cuts across all the four pillars uh, of the program. Uh, it's called Buy from Women, and uh, it's a digital platform that has uh, a module on access to land where women can actually measure uh, their plots, they can locate them geographically, uh, and they have all the information that they need. There is a, uh, also another module by which they can access agroecologic information, the latest training on climate smart um, uh, information and, and, and skills. 
there is a module on access to finance to link to other digital platforms specialized in, in, in finance and there is some last module on, on facilitating precisely through the platform the link between the women producers and, and the, the buyers. Next slide please. So basically how it works is that um, different countries uh, uh, choose different value chains. Uh, there are some criteria to choose uh, the value chain. It's one where women are already uh, very present or there are opportunities for them to be uh, present. There is, it has to be a value chain that it's either, it's either has a strong potential for food security or it's a high value added uh, value chain. For example, in Chad or in Cote d'Ivoire, we are working on she butter. In Mauritania and um, Senegal, we are working on rice. So one is high value chain, value added, the other has a strong uh, food security component. Once we have select, selected the value chain, we work with the women who are already producer transformers, we provide institutional support, uh, we help them uh, organize themselves into national platforms uh, so that they can increase their bargaining power and negotiation in terms of uh, at the time of accessing markets, but also at the time of uh, uh, buying their, their inputs. Um, and there is a, a, a continuous ongoing uh, uh, work of technical assistance and support um, through these uh, platforms of, of women. There is also a component of greening the value chain um, through new product development, through uh, technology, access to information that goes across all the, all the different nodes of the, of the value chain. And uh, here the role of UN women um, and in a way the value added of UN women is, as you saw in the, in the previous slide, there are four different aspects of the program. They all need to work at the same time. There, there is a multitude of actors and stakeholders involved. So in a way, the role of UN Women is to play that brokering, uh, creating that coalition uh, of actors and being the glue between them. And so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that, for example, in, in Senegal, uh, we are working with 25,000 women, but we want to have a, a much larger um, impact. So we select this type of intervention for their demonstration potential. So for us, uh, working in climate smart agriculture, uh, it's uh, the, the goal is to show that women can do the job, that women can play a strong role uh, as economic agents, and then uh, use that as role modeling for future generations, but also leverage that in our policy dialogue with, with authorities. Next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna go very quick over the results. Uh, we have results in the different areas. We've, we've contributed to improving legislation in a number of countries to make sure that there are clauses to respect women's uh, and rights uh, in access to land. Um, we have also contributed to specific allocations of, of, of uh, hectares of, of land to women producers in a number of countries. Next slide, please. There is also um, ongoing several initiatives in different countries with private sector banks to create credit lines uh, targeting women in agribusiness. Um, there is a work of strengthening a number of um, cooperatives, agribusiness cooperatives across different countries in Africa, including the creation of national platforms. Uh, and there is uh, at the level of uh, access to market, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, a nice example is that 2,000 women have been certified in organic uh, production of sea butter. That means that uh, they have increased the value of, uh, of, of their production by 10, uh, and now they have access to markets such as the US and, and, and Europe. So that's the kind of model that we want to promote, one in which women uh, work in agriculture, but in a very empowering way. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
And where we are, um, we this is a global uh, program of UN Women, but the majority of the implementation is happening in Africa. Um, right now, we are in more than 10 countries uh, already implementing an additional 10 uh, under development. Our ambition is to reach uh, 1 million women by 2021. And uh, for that, we, are, we have already fundraised uh, more than 15 million uh, of euros, but there's much more to, to, to continue uh, given that the, the needs, the, the requests from the countries are much larger than, than the resources currently available. And for that, and next slide, please, we work in partnership. We cannot do it alone. Next slide, please. Right, so we work with other UN agencies, we work with governments, we work with the private sector. Um, next slide, please. And, um, but there is still much more to be done. And um, I would like to end the presentation with a couple of questions um, or reflection, open reflections for this audience of green growth practitioners. When we think of green growth policies, we quickly think of uh, macroeconomics, uh, financial policies, but in, for example, in the region, region where I work, in the Sahel, um, green growth has uh, links with many other policies. Environmental degradation is triggering uh, migration for, for, for a start with a huge number of uh, people internally displaced and, and migration happening across countries. Environmental degradation is also uh, triggering conflict uh, between communities, between farmers and, and pastoral groups, and that's uh, really triggering intra-communitar uh, conflict at a large scale. Um, so all of that, I think it's important that we take into account when we think of green growth, the links between all of those. And obviously gender plays a, a role on that. Uh, women can be can bear the consequences of, of those processes, but they can also be clear uh, agents of change in that. So I think it's important that we include this uh, gender-informed political economy perspective to, to our work on, on, on green growth. And the other thing that I would like to, to, to leave uh, with the audience is, um, as a UN agency, we have a mandate to leave no one behind. How do we make sure that uh, finance flows to the hardest to reach groups? What are the good policies and strategies to, to achieve that? I mean, we know that in Africa alone, we have a 42 billion um, gap in, in finance for women-led businesses, and there are amazing initiatives ongoing, like FAWA just recently um, launched to target women-led businesses, but uh, we risk having those small rural women entrepreneurs, uh, agricultural cooperatives, um, not being benefited from, from those efforts. So it's important that we also uh, think of policies and strategies to reach the, the, the hardest uh, uh, to reach groups. Um, and with those two um, open reflections, I would like to end the presentation. Thank you very much. And I will be looking forward to hear your questions and participating in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena, for that very nice presentation and for summarizing very well uh, in your last slide uh, uh, the, the, the issues that are perhaps the most important, uh, the, 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 the importance of working across sectors and the importance of being innovative also on the social side, not only technologically innovation or finance innovations, but also social innovations to reach the, the people who are the most uh, difficult to reach. Um, so uh, now we have come to uh, the part of this webinar where we will be discussing a few questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, so I will invite uh, uh, Catherine and Justina to also turn their cameras on so we can uh, see you all. 
Hello, there you are. Great. Um, yes, and thank you so much to the audience for uh, for for staying engaged throughout these presentations. Uh, I have been uh, taking notes along the way based on the the questions that have come in, and I've been working to to categorize uh, a little bit uh, so that we are able to address as many as possible within the, the in in the coming fifteen minutes or so that we have left. Um, so um, I wish to. Um, start with uh, uh, a series of questions that have come in that are linked to the importance of economic policy. Uh, so Catherine, uh, maybe I sh can ask you uh, to speak a little bit to the importance of economic policy in addressing the root causes of uh, gender inequality and to empower women. And one of the specific examples that one of the, the, the members of audience uh, raised was how can we, for example, address the issue of unpaid domestic work in, in economic um, policy? And maybe slightly related to that, are there any alternative ways for a nation to measure wealth uh, that goes beyond the current uh, GDP that does not take into account gender equality. So, Catherine, I don't know if you have a couple of reflections around those two. Yeah. So, um, in terms of economic policy, the key uh, stakeholders here, first of all, are central banks and the ministries of finance. And so, engagement with them is going to be critical as part of this, this process. Some of them, I should add, have been um, engaging through organisations such as the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, very specifically on the uh, women's uh, financial inclusion gap, which does vary between country, um, as do patterns of not just women and men's access, but also their usage of financial services and their control over it. But, um, but uh, beyond that, there is scope in other policy areas that um, are within the remit of, of the central bank and, and ministries of finance that are relevant um, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for addressing um, the, the gender perspectives. And, and so um, one um, uh, area is around tax, which and the tax incentives to get women into the workplace and to stay there. And that addresses this unpaid care burden to some extent, um, but also issues um, which um, also engage other ministries related to policies um, to do with maternity and paternity leave. And whilst that isn't necessarily an economic policy, it has an indirect consequence as to whether women are the ones that after having had a child are then um, working and uh, choosing to drop out of the workplace and take care of, of, of uh, their, their child as opposed to um, their partners, their male partners, um, if, if they're not having, uh, if they're not fiscal incentives for them to um, sort of return to work, um, for example, it's not just the maternity aspect, actually, it's also the, the, the childcare and whether or not that is financed um, by the government or not and at what stage, um, that can have an impact on these decisions as to whether women are going to return to, to the workplace. And, uh, and the extent to which any parental leave or maternity and paternity leave is, is shared. So there's an economic aspect to that, um, as well as uh, often a uh, role to engage with other ministries. Um, on the point about alternative ways to measure growth, I, I believe that there are some, uh, some governments have been looking at that. I wouldn't be able to quote any specific measures. Bhutan famously has got an index that they look at. Um, and uh, and so it is worth sort of looking at, at what, what others such as they have, have done. Um, the extent to which gender is in, in uh, factor is in, in, uh, sort of integrated into that, I'm not sure. Um, I'd, I'd have to check. But um, yeah, uh, engage with the ministries of finance and central banks, I think, is critical in this. Yeah. And, and uh, Justina, you talked about your experience with national, uh, national green growth planning. And um, now, can we be optimistic and think that the national green growth planning process is a platform to address some of these wider issues um, uh, that are linked to, for example, uh, financial inclusion of women, land rights that you mentioned, 
um, how optimistic can we be? And I think one of the good things that you mentioned, which also caught the interest of the audience, was that Vietnam had actually selected gender as one of the, 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 uh, the, the areas of interest. Uh, so perhaps you can speak a little bit to, to, to that as, as a potential. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I'd like to think that uh, it is a right platform, actually. However, um, the caveat is that in our case in Vietnam, the Vietnam Green Growth Strategy is a strategy, right? So it, it just it can pinpoint where gender should be better included, but it doesn't change the laws, the undermining legislation. So um, I think it can be, and it's important that it is responsive and it has the very big potential of really identifying the areas which should be maybe revised. So another example that I haven't mentioned, I yeah, so obvious. I'm just coming out of the meeting with uh, the Social Affairs Ministry today and um, what they want to do and what they are in the process of doing is reviewing their legislative processes from the past years and seeing what they, in accordance with social impact assessment, is there anything they should change in their processes? And they actually uh, decided to, um, for the next year, to see if they can green their policies, employment policy, social insurance. So how can we green, it's kind of the other way around, but how can we green those um, social policies? So they want to really review the legislation, uh, identify action points and put it into the agenda for the ministry to take action in the next year. So I think it it has a it does have a potential, and um, um, having gender as uh, being this um, active topic in Vietnam is really interesting because when I joined GIZ in Vietnam in 2016, uh, we were really struggling. Ah, oh, what can we do in green growth and gender? I mean, okay, we can monitor how many women participate in our events, but it was really rather low on the, on the engagement sites and now seeing how it is actually driven by um, by the ministries themselves. Of course, uh, I have to say that, for example, the free trade agreements are one of the drivers also for um, why it's on the agenda. Uh, for example, the free trade agreement with the European Union and the CPTPP with um, um, Australia, Japan and so on, they uh, actually I had stipulated that, well, the labor code needs to be changed. And what is in the labor code, um, one of the policies is rising the retirement uh, retirement age, 55 for women, 62 for men, to I think 62 and 65 respectively. So um, we haven't worked on that, but I mean, the labor code itself has some issues that are going to be revised. So um, there are many, many different anchor points. And I also would like to say that the Agenda 2030 as an international agenda, putting a strong focus on integrated policy making, leaving no one behind on gender in Vietnam has been also one of the major drivers for the discussion. Yes, exactly. And I think what you what you say about greening the social and socializing the green or or, or however you want to frame it, I think is, is a sign that the, the 2030 uh, metric for sustainable uh, development is is uh, quite effective. Uh, I also like what you mentioned there in terms of, of free trade agreements incentivizing um, good gender policies. Uh, so, uh, Elena, I don't know if you uh, would like to say something on a question that has been raised around how do we incentivize gender equality and of course in incentivize meaning at, at at different level on the one hand it's, it's incentivizing policy makers to to make good good policy decisions that's one level but then i think uh, in your presentation you're also talking about how do we incentivize gender responsive approaches to agricultural value chains and 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 more sort of sector specific and perhaps more at at uh, at at, uh, at business level where we are, may also be talking about how do we incentivize private sector um, so your, mm -hmm. your thoughts on that uh, thank you thank you for the question um i think it, it depends uh, who do we need to incentivize and and to each different audience, we need to tell a different story, one that makes sense for them. So let me give you the example of the question that you asked to Catherine uh, on the care economy. How do we incentivize investments on, on care uh, infrastructure? 
So for example, Young Women has developed uh, a methodology uh, to measure how much uh, you could win in terms of GDP contribution if you were to invest in new care infrastructure by taking into account women's participation in the labor force and the taxes that those women could, could uh, be paying. So when you have that those data and, and you do the calculations, it makes a lot of sense to invest in care infrastructure. So that type of research can be very instrumental in, in making the case and building that business case, at least for governments, to, to make those, those social investments. Um, if you talk to a different audience, private sector, banks, for example, why to invest in women-led businesses? Uh, I guess my question would be, why not? They are a huge market. We just need to show to them that there is a huge opportunity there to do business, uh, uh, business that is most of the time commercially sound, despite all the myths about uh, 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 MPLs and, and women not uh, returning their loans. When we have the data and the, res and the research to show that that's not the case, there's a strong case to, to invest in, in, in women-led businesses. So I guess uh, the conclusion is that data, we need to, to use the power of data to talk to different audiences with the language and, and the, the type of messages that they need to hear to, to see that investing in women makes uh, uh, not only uh, sense from the point of view of, of human rights, but also economic sense and business sense. Yeah, and I think now you're also touching upon one of the questions that has come in about the, why is it important to have gender desegregated data? So perhaps uh, should I address that to you, Elena, because I think you are sort of halfway there to answering uh, that question. Definitely. I mean, uh, lack of gender desegregated data, it's, it's, it's a real problem. You put two gender experts in a room and, and the one thing that they will agree and they will talk about it's gender desegregated data. But thanks uh, uh, to a number of initiatives, uh, uh, and right now we are in a much better position than we were before. So we need to build uh, the capacities of, of our government counterparts to produce those data, also to, to properly analyze those data and make the right uh, policy decisions. Um, uh, and as, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, one of the fifth is, uh, of the five uh, strategic areas of we, UN Women is planning and budgeting. And there, there is a strong uh, emphasis on building that capacity of governments uh, to produce uh, the right uh, sex segregated statistics and, and to, to use them in the process of policy decision making. Um, and uh, Catherine or Justina, uh, are you aware of any uh, voluntary standards that could be used uh, to certify either private sector uh, initiatives uh, or organizational initiatives as an incentive? That's also one of the questions that we received from the audience. Mm. So, I don't know if any, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm not sure whether you're aware of the W plus standard. That's something to look at. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many different tools out there that um, have slightly different purposes. So it really depends, you know, if it's in a particular sector, there would be sector specific tools potentially out there. Um, have a look at the resources, uh, such as the guidance sheets um, for resources specific to a, a particular topic. Um, just on the data point, do look at Data2X's work, that's the UN Foundation, UN Women's Engage with them on um, some of this extra segregated data work along with um, many other stakeholders that have been brought in that play an important role on that, so look at that. And another uh, resource I just wanted to draw attention to um, was also there's a resource that the uh, the Canadian government um, have which is useful for policy analysis so that's not certification but it's, it's useful to support um, and that's the GBA plus um, tool so the gender-based analysis plus tool um, and I understand that there was a question that came in around um, measurement tools as well um, so a few other tools to look at, um, ICRW, 
great organization um, to look at for the research that they do. So do take a look at that um, if you uh, have time. And they've got um, something which is on uh, measuring women's economic empowerment definitions, frameworks and indicators. And JPAL also has a sim uh, similarly kind of ta uh, targeted um, uh, resource which has recently been published called A Practical Guide to Measuring Women and Girls Empowerment in Impact Evaluation. So again, another useful resource to look at there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, one of the questions that came in is also a question that I encounter when I engage with people around the world on, on gender equality, and that is, do we measure any potential negative impacts of gender equality? Uh, and uh, the audience, the member of the audience who asked that question is, is referring to, for example, an increase in divorce rates or single mothers, uh, th those kinds of, of, of concerns. Um, uh, perhaps, Justina, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on, um, on that or, or one, one of the other members of the, the, the I panel. saw that question was the most difficult one. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true, I mean, uh, of course, um, but as with any initiative, I mean, even in green growth investment, we can see negative social impacts, right? Um, not only gender, like if we produce bioethanol and then we cut trees or if we build uh, windmills, but then we have to resettle or cut mangroves, it has uh, negative, actually other, you know, negative on, um, impact on, on environment. So of course, yes, this might be um, might be a part of the story. Um, however, I'd like to think uh, in Vietnam, if you when we work with with our um, counterparts, most of um, our direct counterparts are women. So men occupy leadership positions, but actually who do the work and have a lot of power in terms of the actual you know operations are women. In VIZ, I think, I don't know what is the, the, the ratio of women and women, but I have the impression like most projects are actually um, um, Vietnamese women. So, um, yeah, there might be some negative effects at which we have to avoid and, um, and count in within the policy cycle if uh, possible. Mm, but I think that's as far as my answer can go <laughs> on this one. Yeah. Anyone else want to say something on that? Uh, Elena, perhaps? Well, it's a tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. For a start, I don't know if I would consider divorce like bad news. If you're a woman in a marriage with where you're experiencing domestic violence, that bad news for someone is a very good news for someone else. But I think we need to be careful. I mean, these are very complex uh, uh, social dynamics and, and we all know, especially when we are working at the community, at the household level, uh, women empowerment, economic empowerment in particular, can threaten the existing power dynamics and can lead to, to, to other negative outcomes. Uh, what to do? Uh, I mean, we just need to be very careful, do our due diligence, and, and, and perhaps, uh, I mean, a, a participatory and consultative approach always helps uh, working with the right stakeholders. When we do climate smart agriculture, we don't do this in a vacuum. I mean, we involve everyone. We talk to the traditional leaders. We make sure that whatever positive outcome is going to come from this group of women is perceived as a shared benefit for, for the community. So it's, it's not an easy answer, uh, uh, but there are some strategies that you can put in place. Yeah, and I think I think the key here is is of course engaging also with men, and I think that's that's one of the the the, the key messages across the, our institutions is that engagement happens with women and it happens with men, and I believe coming from Norway, I I, I am from Norway, and I think the the messaging that we are generating there and the evidence that we are generating there is generally that gen, gender equality is good for men and for women. Um, and that men now have more opportunities to be good fathers, for example, and that's a, that's a positive outcome for men and men's health um, and so forth. And so I think that uh, it, it is about perspective. And, 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 and back to, I think uh, all of you have mentioned the importance of listening to many voices and listening to good for who or bad for who and who are impacted in what mm -hmm. way. Uh, so uh, perhaps the last and final 
question before we before we close is um, and maybe I'll address this to you, Catherine. Um, uh, any uh, experience on good good ways to bring in more voices of women in decision making in green growth? In green growth. Um, I think really uh, it's it's in, engaging um, with women, I, and I've seen examples across the energy value chain, women in these different roles, um, and so looking at what the value chain is, the extent to which there are women in different roles within that value chain and within the wider business environment as well, so that includes in the enabling environment and policy making roles, and ensuring that whoever is being engaged at each stage of that value chain and within the engage in that enabling environment, um, there are both female and male representatives in, involved so that you're not just getting um, yeah, a singular voice. At the same time, um, there have been a number of examples, again, particularly in the energy um, sector, where it has been shown to be valuable to engage also specifically with women um, uh, because of certain gender dynamics can um, be upset or can influence the outcomes of those discussions. To be honest, I don't think this is unique to just green growth processes or green sectors. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's not enough to just have had women and men in diverse groups being consulted. It also provides a very added value to consult um, for, with, with women alone um, across these different stakeholder groups. And I'll leave it there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that was a very nice way to also conclude uh, our discussion today. This is a discussion that could go on and on, um, but we have reached um, uh, our time limit. Uh, so I wish to thank you all for your participation and to the presenters, to the audience, to GDKP, uh, to all of you who, who have been uh, working in the background, sending us messages along the way. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been an honor to be here. Uh, we hope to continue this work in 2020. Um, we are also in discussions now with GDKP about perhaps looking at opportunities to establish a gender platform or a gender working group under the GDKP uh, umbrella. So stay tuned, that may come and, um, and we would uh, very much appreciate everybody who wishes to be a part of that conversation. So with that, Thank you very much to all and see you again soon. Happy New Year and happy holidays to those of you who will go on leave. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Goodbye. much. Happy holidays. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.